Segment one, the landscape of Mexico and Central America. Before watching the landscape of Mexico and Central America, think about this. What are the advantages of moving from a rural area to a large city? What are the disadvantages? Mexico and the nations of Central America connect the United States to South America. Shaped like a funnel, Mexico is more than three times the size of the seven countries of Central America, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. Mexico is bordered by the Pacific Ocean to the west and the Gulf of Mexico to the east. Central America is bordered by the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. Together, Mexico and Central America are home to millions of Latin Americans. Spanish is the official language in each of these countries except Belize. Belize was claimed by Britain in 1862, and English, rather than Spanish, is the official language there. Knowing where people live, why they live there, and how they get from one place to another is vital to understanding the geography of an area. Let's start with Mexico's population. More than 100 million people live in Mexico. To find work, many Mexicans have migrated from rural areas to urban areas. When people migrate, they leave their homes and move to a new place permanently, usually to improve their living standards. There are more opportunities for employment in large cities, like Mexico City. More than 18 million people live in Mexico City, the capital of Mexico. Located near the center of the country, it is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. Mexico's topography has rivers, mountains, and plateaus. The Rio Grande separates Mexico from the southern border of the United States, and the peaks of the Sierra Madre Oriental and the Sierra Madre Occidental run down the eastern and western parts of the country. Plateaus form the largest section of Mexico where most of the population lives. A plateau is a large raised area of mostly level land. Northern Mexico receives little rainfall. Its desert area is a continuation of the deserts of the United States. Mexico's plateaus receive more rainfall, and the soil is fertile from volcanic ash. This is farming country. The mountains of Mexico have sparse vegetation but they are rich with other natural resources, gold, silver, copper, and many other minerals. Buried deep underground, these minerals are the result of the volcanic activity that formed the mountains millions of years ago. The mountains of southern Mexico are over 17,000 feet above sea level. If you traveled from there to the southernmost coasts of Panama, you would experience an extreme drop in elevation. And as the elevation changes, the terrain changes dramatically. The rocky terrain of northern Mexico supports only the hardiest plants. But the isthmus of Panama, at sea level, is covered with swamps and thick forest growth. 
Notice how the mountains and rivers cross Central America on this physical map. Let's add the country borders. What do you observe? Many of the borders follow mountains and rivers. In many cases, natural features determined country boundaries. Central America's tropical climate and fertile soil are ideal for agriculture. Many people here earn a living by farming. Mexico and the countries in Central America bridge the United States and South America. The terrain of these countries ranges from mountainous to coastal to lush tropical rainforests. From Central America's farmland to Mexico's abundant mineral deposits, this region provides its people with a rich array of natural resources. Now that you've seen the landscape of Mexico and Central America, talk about this. Seven countries make up Central America. How are the borders of many of the countries determined? Segment two, living with natural hazards. Before watching living with natural hazards, think about this. What are natural disasters? How do they impact people's lives? Mexico was created by a chain of volcanic mountains, shaped by millions of years of geologic shifts, earthquakes, and explosions. Mexico's location at the border of two tectonic plates makes it prone to devastating earthquakes, volcanoes, and giant waves. Volcanoes created the majestic Sierra Madre that rise in the northern part of the country. Volcanic activity here left deposits of the valuable minerals gold and silver and volcanic ash from the volcanoes in southern Mexico has made the fertile farming valleys. But earthquakes and volcanoes have taken their toll on Mexico's land and people. Major earthquakes have shaken Mexico since the time of the ancient Aztecs, and violent earthquakes still ravage the coasts and dense urban areas, like Mexico City, killing thousands. The place on the Earth's surface where an earthquake starts is the epicenter. From here, the quake's waves ripple outward. Mexico City is not directly over fault. It is inland, nearly in the center of the country. So why does Mexico City experience such violent tremors and destruction from earthquakes? History and geology can explain. The Aztecs built what later became Mexico City in a valley that was covered by marshes and lakes. The soil here is extremely soft, and that soft earth carries vibrations from an earthquake, even if its epicenter is far away. Because so many people live in Mexico City, damage from earthquakes can be extensive. When buildings collapse, people often get trapped. Today, city planners are working with scientists to design more flexible buildings and to add support to older buildings in order to prevent this type of destruction from happening. Planning for earthquakes is essential here, but earthquakes aren't the only natural hazard Mexicans must endure. When tectonic shifts occur in the ocean, they can trigger catastrophic waves that hit the coast. These massive waves are called tsunamis. In 1995, an earthquake off the coast of central Mexico caused a tsunami that had devastating and deadly results. 
And there's another natural disaster caused by tectonic movements. Just 30 miles from Mexico City, this harmless looking mountain has a boiling center just waiting to erupt. Popocatepetl, a volcano called the Smoking Mountain, releases occasional plumes of smoke. Formed by tectonic movement, volcanoes can be just as destructive as earthquakes. Scientists measure the amount of sulfur dioxide in a volcano's smoke plumes. The higher the levels, the more likely the mountain is going to erupt. This data gives residents in Mexico City time to prepare for the next eruption. Mexicans also prepare for a weather phenomenon called El Nino that happens about once every four years. In Spanish, El Nino refers to the Christ child because it tends to happen around Christmas time. El Nino is a warm ocean current that forms and flows along Mexico's western coast and creates dramatic changes in the atmosphere. El Nino causes hurricanes, floods, and droughts. What starts as an ocean current in the Pacific Ocean has a tremendous effect on the weather patterns in Mexico, other parts of Latin America, and the United States. As scientists gather more information about the powerful forces that cause these natural disasters, the better Mexicans can prepare for the hazards to come. Surviving natural hazards in Mexico is, for many, a way of life. Now that you've seen living with natural hazards, talk about this. Mexico City experiences great damage from earthquakes. What are city planners doing to help prevent this problem? Segment 3, Guatemala's Coffee Economy. Before watching Guatemala's Coffee Economy, think about this. What topographic features shape Guatemala as a farming country? Nestled in the northern part of Central America, Guatemala is bordered by Mexico to the north, Belize to the east, and Honduras and El Salvador to the south. Its western coast borders the Pacific Ocean, and its eastern coast borders the Caribbean Sea. Like most other countries in Central America, Guatemala was a Spanish colony. Guatemalans gained their independence in 1821. In the old capital city of Antigua, you can see reminders of Spain's influence in the architecture, like this Catholic church. Guatemala is known for its coffee beans. Coffee plants thrive in altitudes of 2,000 to 6,000 feet and need about 60 inches of rainfall a year. Guatemala's high mountain ranges, running from east to west, high average rainfall, and rich soil provide just the right conditions for growing coffee plants. Coffee has been a leading export for many Latin American countries, and coffee production has shaped Guatemala's economy its landscape. 
Most of the demand for coffee comes from the United States and Europe. Coffee trees take three to four years to mature before fruit appears. Growers harvest the berries from December to February. At this stage, the berries look nothing like the coffee you see at the store. They look more like cranberries. The deep red color means they are ready to be harvested. The berries are transported in bags to a processing plant. High-pressure water separates the coffee beans from their outside husks. Workers use water to move and sort the millions of beans that are harvested each year. Next, the beans go into a spinning wheel that removes the pulp. Ripe beans split from the pulp, unripe beans don't. Then the beans are soaked in water for up to 40 hours. Workers carefully wash the beans to remove twigs, debris, and poor quality beans. The wet beans are spread out to dry. Finally, they are roasted. Shipped all over the world, these beans will make the coffee millions of people drink. Because coffee production and other agriculture is a major part of Guatemala's economy, many Guatemalans earn a living by farming. As long as coffee remains a popular drink, Guatemala will continue to export this precious bean. Now that you've seen Guatemala's coffee economy, talk about this. Why is coffee production important to the economy of Guatemala? What are the potential problems for an economy that relies on a single crop? Segment 4, The Disappearing Forests of Panama. Before watching The Disappearing Forests of Panama, think about this. What geographic features of Panama made it a good choice to build the Panama Canal? As the narrowest and southernmost country in Central America, Panama is a bridge to South America. It is bordered to the northwest by Costa Rica and to the southeast by Colombia. Panama is an isthmus, a narrow strip of land surrounded by water that connects two larger land areas. The Pacific Ocean lies to the southwest, the Caribbean Sea to the northeast. Notice that Panama is shaped like the letter S. Dense rainforests thrive in Panama's tropical climate. This region in the southeast of Panama is known as the Darien. It is the largest rainforest in Central America. Visit this humid region of thick vegetation and you enter the domain of boa constrictors, two-toed sloths, and ocelots. Thousands of other species of plants and animals inhabit the rainforest. For the people who live here, Having a machete comes in handy. It's the only way to cut a trail through the dense growth. It may be difficult for humans to survive in the sticky, hot, bug-infested forests of Panama, but many plants and animals thrive here. Thousands of species exist nowhere else in the world.
But much of this forest is disappearing because people are clearing the trees for logging, mining, and subsistence farming. Cutting down forests is called deforestation, and in Panama, it is taking place at a rapid rate. To try to protect the forest, Panama's government has created national parks. Cutting down trees is not permitted in these areas. Without protection, many species of plants and animals become endangered. Clearing forests and cutting down trees was necessary for one of the greatest feats of engineering. The Panama Canal took nearly 10 years to build, cost millions of dollars, and took the lives of thousands of workers. A canal is a man-made waterway used for navigation or irrigation. A system of locks controls the water levels of the canal to allow ships to pass through. A lock is an enclosure made of concrete walls with steel gates that rise and lower water levels to allow boats to pass from level to level. The builders dug the canal through the isthmus. Instead of traveling around the tip of South America, ships use this passageway as a shorter route to transport goods all over the world. The canal forever changed the route for ships trying to pass from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Altering the landscape for the Panama Canal and clear-cutting trees for logging, mining, and farming have benefited Panama economically but sometimes at the expense of the environment. Restricting deforestation will help to protect the species of plants and animals living in the rainforest. Now that you've seen the disappearing forests of Panama, talk about this. Why is rapid deforestation taking place in Panama? How might this affect the ecology of the country?